Hare Krishna. Everybody, nice and loud, give a wonderful round of applause to Ajashwi Prabhu Ki! Gave us life plus extra life. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for coming. <laughs> Om Agyan, Timirandasya, Ginajana, Salakaya, Chaksu Unmilitam Yena, Tasmai, Shri Gurave Namaha, Shri Taitanya, Mano Bistam, Staptitam Yena Bhutale, Swayam Rupa, Kadamayam Dadati Swam Padanti Kam. One day, hum, shigaro, shigata, padekamalam, shigarun, vaishnavams, cha, si rupam, sagrajatam, sahagana, ragana, tam, vitam, tam, sajeev, hum, sa dvaitam, sarvadutam, parijana, sahita, Krishna, chaitanya, devam, Sri radha, Krishna, padam, sahagana, lalita, Sri vishakam, vitam, cha, Hey Krishna Karuna Sindhu Dina Bandhu Jagat Pate Gopesha Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namostate Tapta Kanchana Gaurangi Radhe Brinda Veneswari Vrishabhanu Suti Devi Pranamami Hari Priye Vancha Kalpa Tarubhischa Va Sindhu Paevacha Paditanam Pavane Pyo Vaishnave Pyo Namaho Namaha Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadadara Sivasadi Gauda Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare mm. So this is a very Glorious occasion, we can take the opportunity to honor the Supreme Personality of Godhead who manifests himself as Lord Ramachandra. The uh, opportunity to glorify the Lord is always available. But on the special days of the appearance of the Lord, there is special mercy available for all those who take part in this mood of glorification, either by speaking about or hearing from the glories of the Lord. Um, I'm trying to think what I haven't said in the last four classes. This is my fifth class on Ram Nomi in the last four days. So I guess I'll just have to repeat something. <laughs> just, But uh, since it is the appearance of the Lord, it's nice to take time to look about and see how that appearance manifested. And it's a very deep pastime, and it really illustrates uh, the bhakti of Dasarat. <laughs> this particular leela took place in the Treta Yuga, which is about approximately, as is estimated by the Acharyas, about two million years ago. And it's interesting, although this Leela, this pastime, took place two million years ago, it's still fresh, it's still interesting, and still gives the same amount of knowledge and transcendental enthusiasm as it was when it was actually happening. You don't see, and you see in the material world, if there is some outstanding event, time sort of withers away the importance of that, and things are off after some time are forgotten. And the only time you can remember it is if you read a book about it. But here, the pastimes of the Lord are ever fresh. <laughs> because the Lord is performing activities that are above the three modes of material nature. They're always transcendental. And they're always directed towards awakening the natural devotion, 
natural love of the conditioned souls. Ramadi Murti Sukala Nimamain and Tishtan Nanavatara Akaro Bhuvane Sukinchu Krishna Swayam Sama Bhavat Pamaman Pamanyo Govindam Adipurusham Tamaham Bajami. Out of the all of the incarnations of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Ramachandra is one of the chief manifestations of those incarnations. Within the realm of the Vaikuntha, within the Vaikuntha realm, there are different gradations of planets, and the highest and most elevated planet of all is uh, Ayodhya Dham in the spiritual world. That same Ayodhya Dham manifests here in the material world in order for the Lord to perform his pastimes. Yada yada hi dharmasya, glanir bhavati bharata, abhutanam madharmasya, tadatmaham srijami aham, pravitra nayam sadunam vinasanaya chaduskritam, dharma samstarpanartayam sambhavami yuge yuge. This particular verse, two verses actually from the Bhagavad Gita, is a foundational principle by which the Lord follows in practically all of his incarnations. He comes in his different manifestations for three reasons. One, when irreligion becomes prominent in the world and religious principles become obscured and people become unhappy. At this net and when that becomes, what we say, full blown, the Lord personally manifests himself in one of his incarnations to rectify the situation, to bring back true religious principles and to rid the world of irreligion. And he also comes, which is probably the most important reason, is to give pleasure to his devotees, to give his devotees a chance to worship him as he manifests himself in his transcendental form in this material world. So the Lord is very kind. <laughs> That's one of the features of the, the, the nature of the Lord. He's extremely kind. There is a particular verse in the sixth canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam which explains the glories of many of the qualities of the Lord, his opulences, his, his uh, qualities in so many ways. But then it mentions that out of all of them, his kindness is most relishable, especially by his devotees because he's always thinking about the welfare of others along with performing his pastimes. And he performs his pastimes in order to give the conditioned souls an opportunity to wake up from this material slumber and come back to their natural position of devotion towards him, which is the position of eternal happiness and full transcendental knowledge. So Lord Ramachandra appeared in the kingdom of Ayodhya, where Dasarat is the undisputable king. And he had probably great sovereignty and rule throughout the area. Of course, there were many demons, but there was nothing as powerful as Ayodhya Dham. It mentions, as it describes in this particular Lila, that everything was ideal. The city was 96 miles square long and 24 miles square wide. It wasn't a small place. <laughs> it was quite, what we say, big. And um, everybody in the city was following religious principles. Everyone. The four Varnas, Kshatriya, Brahman, Kshatriya, Vaishya, and Sudra, everyone was working according to their natural occupation. There were no diseases, no calamities, no enmity amongst the citizens. There was no atheists in the entire city, although there were millions and millions of inhabitants. And the streets were lined with various jewels and gems and there were elephants sprinkling water on the streets. There were beautiful ponds, waterfalls, birds. 
And everything was so beautiful, so nicely arranged, both from the material point of view and ideal in the spiritual practice, that it rivaled Amavarati, which is the kingdom of uh, Indra in the, in the heavenly planets. And despite all of that, all of the opulence, all of the beauty, all of the success on all levels, everyone was happy. There was one person that wasn't happy, and that was the king, Dasara. <laughs> Although he was the king of this very magnis magnanimous and magnificent city, which was unrivaled, he was unhappy because he couldn't get an heir to the throne. He was moving on in age, and he was thinking soon, I need to remove out of my position, but who will take that position? I must produce somehow a follower. But as much as he tried, no son was born. It seems like that was his fate. So he was quite despondent because of that, and that really weighed upon his mind. His priest, the head priest of uh, Ayodhya, Vashishta, came to him in one day, knowing the situation and also knowing how to bring about a solution to the situation. He came and he said, my dear king, actually there is a way we can produce a heir to the throne and that person can also be your son. <laughs> So Dasarad got a little bit enthusiastic hearing here, here's the solution. Because he had faith in Vashishta. Vashishta was such a powerful Rishi. Just the whole life of Vashishta is quite amazing. How he defeated many of the other Rishis simply by his Brahman Tejas. He was a Brahmarshi. There's different levels of Brahmins and he was the highest Brahmarshi. That means he had all Brahminical power. And he said to the king, actually, you remember many years ago, you gave your daughter, he had one daughter, Shanta. He gave it to a fellow king in a neighboring kingdom named Romapad. Just because Romapad also had the same difficulty, he could not have an heir. And so he wanted at least some child, so he gave him his daughter. And his daughter was staying with Romapad. And then, of course, it goes on to describe that Romapad's kingdom was fraught with a drought. He had committed some offense. It doesn't say what. But because of his offense, there was no rain in his kingdom. And it went on for months and months and months. And literally, the whole area was drying up, and it was becoming a, what we, a, a disaster. So something had to be done. So Vishishta came, knowing he could solve two problems in one go. <laughs> so he said, actually, there is a great Rishi. He lives in the forest. His name is Rishishringa. He is a mendicant. He's a young boy. He lives with his father, Mirga Rishi. And that boy has never been outside of his ashram. He has never seen another person in his whole life except his father. Because his father wanted to protect him from any outside influences. So that he was somewhat, you might say, fanatical. <laughs> <laughs> to use a small word. <laughs> you might say outside of the norm, maybe a little insane. <laughs> he wouldn't let his son go anywhere nor would he allow anyone to come into the cottage in ashram. So the boy only knew his father, and his father would gather roots and fruits and various foodstuffs, and he would take care of his son. And the boy was quite young, he would still, he was still, I don't know how old he was, but he was marriageable age. <laughs> so Vishishta said, you go to Romapad and you explain that do something to bring Rishishringa out of the forest and to your kingdom and marry him to your daughter who is now with Romapad. And after that marriage, 
bring both of them here because Rishishringa will be able to, by his Brahman Tejas, to perform a sacrifice and that sacrifice will f fulfill your desires to have a son. So he could, in Brahm, Brahmarshi, they have the power to see the future also, past, present, and future. There are devotees, even in our Krishna consciousness movement, who have ability to read your mind. Be careful. <laughs> I'll tell you a little side story. I was with one person who was very good at that. His name was Bhakti Tirta Swami. <laughs> I spent so much time with him. And... Uh, he had, a lot, he had a lot of mystic power along with his spiritual practice. So one day, and of course I, was, I would spend time with him and he would spend a lot of time helping families overcome their struggles in family life and also the difficulties that were with children. So I was seeing regularly, he's spending so much time with women and children. He's a sannyasi, you know, Haribo. <laughs> So I was thinking like that, and then he was there, and he looked at me, and he said, they need it, that's why I'm doing it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Hurry, Beau <Beaumart. laughs> I'm going to be careful. <laughs> and there are many, we were, we were discussing his glories on his birthday, which was the end of February this year, and devotees were saying, Many times he could just point to him and say, why are you thinking about that, you know? <laughs> he had that power. And he never used it in a wrong way, just to help the devotees. So a Brahmarshi can even, is even more powerful. So he could see how the future would unfold if everything went according to plan. So after Omapad heard the plan, he had to bring, somehow he had to bring Rishishringa to the kingdom. And that would overshadow the drought, the drought would stop automatically, and that would lead to them going to Ayodhya. And so, in those kingdoms, of course in the Vedic times, in order to prevent men from polluting other women, there was legal prostitution in the society. Because it says, um, usually it says a man can never be satisfied with one lady. Just the way men are. Shh, don't tell anybody. <laughs> I'm giving you a little insight on, you know, men and how they think, you know. But this is the way it is. That's why they have more than one wife, <laughs> usually. But anyway, to order to not to, what we say, corrupt the innocent women, they would have these prostitutes. And that would allow the men to, you know, fulfill their desires outside of marriage. And that would be considered to be acceptable. Even in Vedic times, that was there. And so, um, Mumapad called three of the ladies, they were called courtesans, that's a nice name for prostitute, <laughs> courtesans. And he said, I have a mission for you. You have to go into the forest, and there is one sage, his name is Rishishringa. Do whatever you can to bring him here. <laughs> Hare Krishna. <laughs> the ultimate weapon. <laughs> so, they were enthusiastic, the young girls, and they were also quite beautiful, and they also had so many feminine qualities. So they went into the, the forest, and they came nearby the ashram of Rishishringa, and they set up their own little camp a distance away and lit a fire and made some smoke just to attract the attention of Rishishringa. Now Rishishringa's father, Riga Rishi, had been away. So Rishishringa was alone. So he became curious, where is that fire coming from? So he wandered away and then he saw these persons sitting around the fire and they were singing nicely, really sweet, very nice songs. And he's looking at them, he said, wow, I never saw men like that before. You know, they were shaped a little bit different. <laughs> and so he was looking at them and he was thinking, 
but they're really kind of beautiful. <laughs> really nice men. <laughs> they must be from the heavens. <laughs> and so when they saw them, they turned to him, and then they started to continue their singing. And then they walked over. They had some baskets with some very nice sweets. And they walked over to him and started handing him some sweets. Now, he never had sweets before, so he's thinking, wow, these are nice fruit. <laughs> I wonder what tree they come from. <laughs> so he's eating these sweets, and then he's seeing these beautiful men, <laughs> which he's thinking. And then all of a sudden, as he's eating the sweets and they're singing nicely, he becomes attracted to their association. And then when he, they become a, he becomes a little attractive, they start to embrace him one after another. There were three of them. That was it. <laughs> His mind was a little bit, what we say, changed. <laughs> that happens. <laughs> and after his mind was changed, he couldn't understand what was that new feeling he was feeling. It was something he never felt in his life before. <laughs> it's called bliss. <laughs> something like that. <laughs> and so, I'm sorry, this is my class tonight. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's been a long day. <laughs> and so he goes back to his ashram, and then the ladies leave. And then he's, he, now he feels really different, and he can't feel comfortable in his ashram. And he's thinking about these nice men he saw <laughs> who had a little bit different postures in certain areas of the body. And uh, he, uh, his mind is now, you know, really disturbed, but in a nice way. <laughs> so he has to find out more. So he goes wandering away, and these girls didn't leave the area. They went to another place, and then they waited and he came out and then they said, come on with us. We will take you to our kingdom where there are so many nice things in our kingdom and you will enjoy very nicely. So already his mind was somewhat submissive to the ladies and he went. When he went there, he was greeted by King Romapad who worshiped him and said, thank you for coming. You are a great sage. I want to reward you by giving you my daughter in marriage. And already he had been halfway there in consciousness. So that marriage was arranged, and as soon as he entered that kingdom, Indra started putting rain in the area. And the whole area became nicely flooded with beautiful rain. And it went on for days and days and days. He was such a powerful sage, just simply by his presence in that kingdom that was condemned because of offense, everything changed. After that happened, Vashishtin alerted Dasra and said, now you go to the kingdom of Romapat and you ask for your daughter, who is actually now with Romapat and Rishishringa, bring him to the kingdom and have Rishishringa perform a yagya. And by that yagya, you'll have a son. So he did that. And after coming to the kingdom, Romapad greeted him very nicely, honored him, worshipped him in so many ways. And then he said to Rishishringa, in the presence of Shanta, this is your actual father-in-law. I am not your father-in-law. He is your father-in-law. So he has a particular yagya that he wants you to perform. So please go. So Rishishringa went along with Shanta, and they went to the kingdom. And then the yogi was set for a particular auspicious time, and then the yogi began. And Rishi Shringa did the, chanted the mantras and started putting the oblations into the fire. And this went on for some time, and everybody is waiting to see the results of this yogi. Of course, I'm skipping part of it. There was an Asmaveda jug that was happening before that that set the standard for the auspiciousness of this fire sacrifice. And now, during that yagya, out of the fire, at one point, when the yagya reached a perfectional stage, a beautiful black-colored personality came. 
he was so beautiful and so nicely dressed in so many ornaments, and he was carrying a pot. <laughs> and then that pot is called, it was called putristi, putristi, that was a particular substance. It was Havashyana. To break it down farther, it was sweet rice. <laughs> and so he hands the pot to Dasarat, this mystical person who comes out of the fire, walks right over to Dasara, says, give this to your queens, your principal queens, and they will become pregnant. So he takes the pot after some time, when the yogi is finished, he goes and he takes half of the sweet rice and gives it to its principal queen, Koshalya. He takes the other half and divides it in half again and take, gives one six to Kaikei. And he gives one six to his other queen, Sumitra. And then there's some left over and he gives the rest to Sumitra again. And all of the women, the three ladies, all of a sudden, after some, not all of a sudden, but within a few days, they all felt that there was a child within their womb. This was the power of that yagya. And of course, after some time, four illustrious persons were born, Vasudev, Sankarshan, Aniruddha, Pradyumna, the manifestation of the Chaturvyuha in the spiritual world. Some people also say the four symbols of, the, of Lord Vishnu, the conch, the lotus flower, the club, and the disc. But either way, according to different versions of the Shastra, they, uh, they manifest themselves as pure spiritual personalities coming from Vaikuntha realm itself. And they grew up, they paired off as friends. Satrugna and Bart were, Satrugna and Lakshman were born to Sumitra. Kaikeyi had Bart and Koshalya had Ram. <laughs> Dasarath was dancing in other happiness. His, his desires were fulfilled. Now he had not only one son, but four illustrious personalities. They were, as they were growing up, they all had good qualities. They were ideal in their behavior, respectful to their parents, and gave, they gave happiness to all that they met. Especially Ram, he was so kind, so compassionate. He was noted for his concern of others. And although he was only a young boy growing up, still, he, as soon as he came in contact with someone, if they had any difficulty, simply by his presence, everything would be wonderful. He was so magnanimous, so beautiful as a personality, and so loving. And his, his mood of compassion was was exemplary. And so they lived in the kingdom for many years, they grew up. And then after some time, Dasarat is thinking, it's time for me to retire. Of course there was a few pastimes in between, like about a hundred that I skipped. <laughs> Because the Ramayan is so full of wonderful. I'll tell one particular pan. When Ram was 16 years old, him and Lakshman became inseparable. Bart and Satruga, and Satrugna became inseparable. They became two prayer pairs of, of very close friends with each other. Of course, they loved each other as, a, in, as their brothers too, but they were especially close to each other in those two pairs. So one day, one powerful rishi came, Vishramita Muni. And uh, he, he was a brahmana. And he came to the kingdom of Dasarat. And he said to Dasarat, after welcome, Dasarat welcomed him so nicely, washed his feet, honored him, and said, my dear brahmana, simply by your presence, our kingdom, everything has become auspicious. Your lotus feet in our kingdom has made everything wonderful. Simply by your presence, everyone is happy. What can we do to serve you? He made a mistake. <laughs> because Vishwamita came with a mission. Actually, that's what, Ra, that's what Dasra said. I know you're here for a reason. What is that reason? He said, well, we are in the forest. 
and we are among many sages, and we are performing yagya, and our yogis are going on very nicely, and when we get near the conclusion of the yagya, there are two powerful rakshashas, Subaha, Subaha, was it? Yeah, Subaha and Maricha. And they come and they defile the whole sacrifice. They stole, they throw stool, and urine, dead bodies, everything on the fire sacrifice. Everything is des desecrated, everything is ruined. So I've come for from some assistance for you. Well, what is that assistance? Well, you have two sons, Lakshman and, and Bart. I'm sorry, Lakshman and Ram. I want to take those two boys and they are powerful. You don't even know the power of your own sons. But they can come and kill these demons. I can kill them myself, but I'm a Brahmin. And therefore, for me to kill them is outside of my Brahminical service. Therefore, I'm seeking the help of the Kshatriyas. And I know Ram and Lakshman are qualified. Dasarat's besides himself with grief. Why, these are just young boys. They haven't hardly been out of the kingdom. And you want them to face these powerful rakshashis? Shakshas. Sure, why not? I know their power. You don't even know the power of your own son. And Basarat made so many excuses. He said, I will come with my armies. I will assist you. No, that's not why I came. I come to get Ram and Lakshman. And... If you do not fulfill my desire, your kingdom will be condemned. <laughs> so he turns in a very, let me say, harsh way towards Dasarat. Dasarat's thinking, you know, I shouldn't offend this. All right. And then he, he let his sons go. But he was praying at the same time. So now these two boys are with Vishwamita and they're happy. And so the sacrifice is going on. Ram and, and uh, Lakshman are there. And towards the end of the sacrifice, right on schedule, these, these Rakshasras, they come. They have power, mystic power. They fly. And then all of a sudden, they, they're about to defile the whole sacrifice. And then Vishwamita Muni alerts Ram and says, they're here. And Ram takes his arrow. And he hit Marichi in the chest and knocked him 800 miles outside the ocean. He went across the ocean to the other side. He wasn't killed. Because Ram was thinking, he's not meant to be killed, but let me get rid of him anyway. So he got him out of him. And then Subaha, he went, <coughs> and that was him. That was the end of him. So he killed Subaha, and he... Not, he, he he knocked Marichi 800 miles. This is, Marichi will be back later on. <laughs> so don't fret, he's, he's not out of the picture yet. And so when Vishramitas Muni understood that, and then he took Ram on tour all through the kingdom. And it's a beautiful narration. Wherever they're going, Ram is asking, what is this place? And Vishramut is narrating, well, this happened here. And this happened here, and this happened here, and this, and this is going on for months and months and months. Of course, finally, Vishramita Muni is thinking, well, these two boys, actually, they're qualified for marriage. <laughs> so I know there is a situation in the kingdom of Mitala. There's a powerful king there. His name is Janaka, and he has four daughters. And the chief of all daughter is Sita. She is what we say qualified in all feminine qualities to the utmost. She is beautiful. She is very obedient to her parents, graceful, sweet, loving, caring, everything of the feminine qualities to the utmost perfection. And she was a young girl. And Janaka was always thinking, I have to find someone to marry my daughter, but who can? 
she's so qualified, it can't be any, any person. So at one time, he was given, after Lord Shiva had a fight with, I forget who it was, but it was, he took his bow and he gave it to Janaka to keep. And he surrendered his bow and left. That bow was the bow of Lord Shiva. And that bow was kept in the kingdom of Janaka in a glass case. And he made a program, Janaka, that anyone who could string this bow could have the hand of Sita. So Kshatriyas came from everywhere because they were thinking this, this lady is the best. <laughs> and But none of them could not even string the bow. They couldn't even pick it up. <laughs> they would somehow come to the bow and try to pick it. couldn't even move it. One day, it's, it's mentioned in this, Sita was cleaning the area of the bow. She lifted up the gas, glass case. She picked up the bow and cleaned and put it back down. Her father saw that and thought, hmm, this person who marries her has to be, you know, has to be the Supreme Lord himself. <laughs> she was so qualified. And she just picked it up like it was, you know, just like a piece of furniture, slight piece of furniture or something. And so Rishramita Muni understood Ram's power, so he took him and Lakshman to the kingdom. And then when he interested, of course, they were welcomed so nicely, and Sita was there and everyone. And then he said that actually Ram has come to win the hand of your daughter. And of course, he had to string that bow. And so there's a whole ceremony that goes on beforehand. But finally, when Ram, it's Ram's turn to string the bow, he walks over to the case, he lifts up the glass covering, he looks at the bow, and then very grave, his mind is undetectable by anyone. He looks at it, places his hand on it, everyone is watching because it's a very tense moment. Will he do it? He picks up the bow and all of a sudden he throws it up in the air over his head like this and he holds it up. Everyone goes, <gasps> And then he takes the bow and takes the string of the bow and strings the bow. And then he takes the bow and he takes it and crack! <laughs> he breaks the bow and it falls in three places and it goes miles away, all of the three places, three different places. Everyone was amazed. <laughs> How is it possible? He's just a young boy. But they didn't know he was actually the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So, of course, after that, then Ram and Sita, beautiful wedding. If you read it, you can read it in the Ramayana. That wedding is so beautiful, so gorgeous. Just the ladies would love it. <laughs> the men might too, huh? but, <laughs> but especially. In Tulsi's Ramayan, we don't really read Tulsi's Ramayan, but he describes that wedding so poetically, so beautiful, that it's a dramatic performance as you read it, so deep and sweet in loving emotion and description of how that whole beautiful wedding played itself out. And of course, there was other ladies and then when Dasarat was alerted that his son was married, they came to the kingdom to honor, and then the other brothers came, and then there was four marriages, and each of the brothers got married to one of the ladies. So that was a, that's a wonderful pastime. Uh, it's so sweet and so deep in loving emotion. And the qualities of Ram and Sita are so much exhibited in that particular pastime. So now, they're back in Ayodhya. And uh, Dasarat now is starting to think, it's about time that I retire. And the only one who was qualified, he actually understood, no one would, re would dispute his choice. Ram would be the next prince regent, the king of Ayodhya. And so that was announced, and all of the citizens Millions of them unanimously agreed with Ram, with Stasrat. Yes, he is the next prince. There was no doubt about that. And so there was a time set 
for the wedding, I mean for the coronation, and everyone was looking forward to that day, but something happened. <laughs> Even the best plans somehow are unexpectedly destroyed by what we say. We can, might call it providence, or we might say it's just some undetectable situation that all of a sudden enters into something wonderful and makes it something else. And so everyone is happy except one person, Mantara. <laughs> Mantara, she's a hunchback. She was actually a apsara, a beautiful lady who committed offenses and fell to the material world and, became, and was born as a hunchback. And so she was not so, what we say, attractive, you might say, from the physical point of view. But she had a good position. She was the mistress or the servant of Kaikeya, who was the favorite queen of Dasarat. Although he, Kaushalya was the mother of Ram, his favorite queen was Kaikeya. She was the youngest of the three. And Dasarad would go to see her whenever he had the opportunity, spend time with her more than the other ladies. And so one day, Mantara starts to make her plan. And she goes and she says to Kaikei, Kaikei, don't you see what's happening? Oh, yes, Kaikei says, yes, tomorrow. Ram will be installed on the throne as the new king, and Dasra will have the opportunity to retire. No, don't you understand? Yes, that will that is what's planned, but you cannot see the future, what will happen. Actually, Dasra is I mean, Ram is not qualified to sit on the throne. Your son, Bart, he is more qualified. Don't you remember your father, Kekaya, was promised by Dasarat that your son would become the king. So that was already there. Dasarat had promised that if Kaikei had a child, a boy, that boy would be the king. So she reminded him, yes, that was the, that was the promise given by Dasarat. But now it's Ram that's going to be the king. And if... Bart becomes the king, then Ram will become envious and Ram will take his armies and do everything to oppose Bart and there will be simply trouble within the kingdom. And then she's just talking like this and she's just opening up her mind, trying to change Kaikei's mind to go against Ram. Kaikei's a little bit... She's a little submissive to hear, but she's a little bit, a little doubtful. But as, as Mantara keeps speaking, she's saying that actually you should understand that the, the destiny is that Bart is meant to be the king. But she's also thinking, Mantara thinks, if Ram becomes the king, then Koshalya will be the, the main queen and he will give all attention to Koshalya and away from Kankaya and that means my position will also be lessened. She was envious. <laughs> she was acting as an envious personality. And finally, Kankaya submitted. Okay, then what should we do? And then she said, don't you remember many years ago on the battlefield, Dasarath was fighting and he was wounded. And you, you took him away from the battlefield and you nursed him back to health. You saved his life. He was very grateful for that. And he said to you, because of you, you saving my life, I will give you two benedictions. You can ask anything you want from me. I will grant your wish. She said, well, nice, but not now. I'll take it in due course of time. So now, Montara says, now you should ask him for those benedictions. You should ask him that instead of Ram becoming the king, Bart should become the king. And in order for Ram not to interfere for Bart's rule, he should be banned to the forest for 14 years. 
the power of bad association. Kaikeyi was a nice person. She loved us and she loved Dasarat and she very much saw Ram as being just as much loving as her own son Bart. But because she listened to this negative criticism, which had no value in reality, her mind became changed. The power of bad association. Devotees should be very much aware that how do we fall from Krishna consciousness? Because we have to understand how this material world works. And one of the ways that one falls from Krishna consciousness is they take association from materialistic people and become somewhat satisfied in that association. And then as that association develops, one starts to develop some of the some of the same tendencies and then one starts to lose their attraction for Krishna consciousness and starts to feel, yes, actually, that disassociation with with these people, I can fulfill all my desires nicely. And that's the devotees should be very clear. That's the part one of fall down. When you lose and leave or don't appreciate and don't take advantage of the association of devotees. The association of devotees is the safe heaven away from the effects of the material energy. Although sometimes that association may be a little difficult, still, if we work with it and keep the right attitude in that association, what is that attitude? I want to serve the devotees. I've come to associate with the devotees to have the opportunity to serve the devotees. If everyone is in that mood, then Sachi Nandana Maharaj tells this nice little parable about what is heaven and what is hell. <laughs> You've heard this particular parable? Yeah, those of you who are disciples know this story. I'll briefly tell it, wherein one man, he goes to heaven, and he's with the St. Peter. He's the CEO of heaven. <laughs> he's in charge. <laughs> and he's, he asks St. Peter, what's the difference between heaven and hell? St. Peter says, all right, I'll show you. Let's go to hell. So they go to hell. <laughs> and it's time for dinner in hell. And so there's a big table, a round table, and in the middle of the table, there are all the items for, for, for eating. This is the, the dinner. And when the bell rings, everyone runs and takes their seat around this round table. Now, the food stays in the middle, and everyone has long forks. And the idea is to take your fork and somehow grab what's in the middle and eat it. But because the food is so far away and the forks are so big, that people are going for the food and they're dropping it and they're hitting each other's fork and they're falling it down and nobody can eat. That's hell. <laughs> so he said, all right, now you know what hell is. <laughs> So let's go to heaven, and I'll show you what heaven is. So, same situation, round table, food in the middle, long forts, the bell rings, all the residents of heaven sit down, and as soon as they begin eating, they take the fork and they feed the person across the way. So one people's taking this and feeding, and everybody's getting something to eat by everyone else's feeding like that. He said that is the difference between heaven and hell. That's the difference between material and spiritual life. Materialists are always interested in their own plans, their own desires, their own sifas. Devotees are only interested in how to serve others, how to serve Krishna, how to serve the mission of Srila Prabhupada and Lord Chaitanya. And that's what makes devotees happy. And they can fulfill all their desires simply by that mood of service. Because when you're in that mood of service, you reap the mercy of the Supreme Lord. And by that mercy, everything becomes wonderful. So keeping the association of devotees means really making progress 
in Krishna consciousness and losing that association or not taking advantage of it or not appreciating how, how wonderful it is to associate with devotees, then gradually one's enthusiasm for Krishna consciousness will become more and more directed to something outside. So be careful. <laughs> always stay in association of devotees and always look for opportunities to serve the devotees. And in that way, you'll always be in the position to get to receive the mercy of the Lord. And so, finally, Kaikeya agrees. All right, she calls Dasarat. Dasarat comes, and uh, Dasarat's there to spend some time with her. But when he comes, she's not in a very happy mood. She changes her place. She goes away from her palace, and she goes to a place called the sulking room. When you're unhappy, you go there and you express your unhappiness. So she's laying on the floor. Her ornaments are scattered in different places. She looks very aggrieved. Dasarat comes in, sees his favorite queen. He becomes concerned. He goes and picks her up, says, my dear wife, what is, why are you feeling like this? Why are you unhappy? Let me help. She says, oh, don't you know? Yeah, what, do, do I know what? Well, tomorrow, Ram's going to be installed. Yes, everyone is happy. And then all of a sudden, she switches. Don't you remember years ago, you gave me two boons, and you said that I can take these boons anytime I want. Well, right now I want to take advantage of your promise. Okay. Whatever you ask for, I promise to grant you. Okay. My, my request is that Bart becomes king instead of Ram. And Dasarat said, fine, if that's for your desire. But then she said, and Ram should be banished in the forest for 14 years. Oh boy, that was like a, a thunderbolt to the head of uh, Dasarat. He couldn't believe what he heard. He wasn't sure she was talking. Is this the same person? And he, he, he actually became stunned. And then he, she told it, she mentioned it again, she could, cause she could understand. He didn't hear it properly. And then when he understood she was serious, he simply collapsed to the floor and fainted. After some time, he came back to consciousness. He tried everything he could to change her mind, but she was fixed. She wouldn't budge. And she gave so many reasons why this should be the case. And Dasarat did everything he could. And then when he realized that he couldn't change her mind, he said, I am not going to fulfill your promise. She said, you're a Kshatriya, and your word is like law. When people find out that you have broken your promise, you will be criticized, you'll be vilified, you'll be seen as a weak an impotent king, everything, and you will not be happy, you won't be able to live simply by being criticized for breaking your promise. He could understand that what she was saying had some value. And now his mind is disturbed. And then to fast forward, he calls Ram, and then the whole thing is broken to Ram. Ram says, my dear father, if that's what you want, I'd be happy to go to the forest. This is your order. You are my father. My, your wish is my command. So Ram had no doubt. And this is a very important part to the whole Ramayan, that Ram was the most qualified, and everyone wanted Ram. And at the same time, he was not attached to the position of being king. Another interesting point in Krishna consciousness. Sometimes we think, Boy, if I could be the temple president, or if I could be, you know, if I could get this position in Krishna consciousness, I can control the devotees, you know. <laughs> they can listen to me. I have to listen to them. Now they'll have to listen to me. <laughs> or I can get this position, and then I can get some extra maha prasadam. <laughs> in other words, if we seek out position within the society of Vaishnavas, 
It's another anomaly. It's contrary to the principle of devotional service. One who is offered a position or qualifies and then is given a position is, understands that position is a position simply for greater service. It's not a position for enjoyment. It's not a position for control. It's a position for service. So whether you are a guru, sannyasi, temple president, head of a department, or whatever your situation, our mood is to serve. That's all. <laughs> and if we keep that mood, we're always happy in whatever position we're in. <laughs> and so Das, I mean, I'm sorry, Ram, he, not, he didn't go against his father's... Uh, uh, you know, he went along with his father's wish, and he said, I'm happy to go. I'll leave as soon as you command me to leave. Of course, and then what happened later on, and then Lakshman found out, and he said, I'm going with you. I can't be separated from you. If you don't let me to go with me or you, I'll just fast till death. <laughs> and then uh, Ram understood Lakshman's love for him, and they were inseparable, so Ram immediately agreed. Then when Sita found out that her husband was going to the forest, and she came and she said, if you're going to the forest, I'm also going to the forest. I'm your wife. A wife is never separated from her husband. How can a wife live without a husband? And then Ram said to her, but how can you go to the forest? You're such a, a frail lady. You know, you're used to opulences and so many nice beds and jewelry and finery and so many wonderful people around you in the forest. It's cold, there's rakshasas, it's dangerous. You have to sleep on the ground and there's, you know, it's, it's, there's nothing to eat. You'll be eating fruits and roots and this it's no place for a lady like you. And then she said something powerful. She said, and this is really powerful, she said, Ayodhya, without you, is the forest, and the forest with you is Ayodhya. <laughs> and then Ram understood she was fixed. And she said, if you leave, I will also give up my life. So Ram reluctantly agreed to take her. And I think I have to stop there. We should stop at 8 o'clock, or should we continue? I'm watching the clock because I don't want to interfere. So we, should I continue, or should we? It's all right? You, okay. As long as you don't start chanting that mantra, Sarira Vidya Jaya, you know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> There's many mantras, and each one has a certain element of attraction to it. <laughs> so, and then, of course, then they're off to the forest, and that's a whole nother scene. And then the whole scene now, when the citizens found out that Ram is no longer going to be the king, and they, they thought, if Ram is going to the forest, we're going to the forest. <laughs> and so when Ram got on the chariot of Sumantra, the chariot driver, uh, along with Lakshman and Sita, the citizens followed, and the whole city followed Ram into the forest, everyone. <laughs> and Ram was thinking, what is this? The whole Ayodhya was desolate. There only, was only Kaikeyi and a few other people left in the city. And at one point, they stopped for the night, and Ram was thinking, this is not good. The citizens should go back. So he woke up in the middle of the night, and he told Sumantra, take your chariot and drive in different circles and make imprints on the ground so people can't follow the chariot and go in a different direction. And then in the middle of the night, they left, and when the citizens woke up, they were gone. And then the citizens started to think, we have to find Ram, but they couldn't find him. And then after some time, they all were forced to return back to Ayodhya. 
So I'll stop there because as we go on, there's more and more pastimes about. Of course, one of the most important and interesting pastimes is when they were in the forest for thir 13 years. Why 14 years? Why has that number 14 been chosen? It's interesting. It's the law of primogeniture that according to the age, a person has claim over its rightful property for a certain amount of years, and they can make some case based on that. But after a certain amount of years, that, that, that claim is no longer. So in, in Treta Yuga, 14 years. After 14 years, you lose your claim to your rightful property if you don't make it. After 13 years, that's why the Pandavas were exiled in the forest for 13 years. That was Dupara Yuga. And in this age, uh, Kali Yuga, it's 12 years. And then there's one devotee here who was telling me in Slovenia, it's 10 years. <laughs> so Slovenia got into the Ramayan somehow. <laughs> so anyway, that was an extra part of the past time. And so after 13 years, they're in the forest, and it's coming to the end, and then this last year. Now, at one point, uh, a very powerful Rakshasha army headed by Dushana, Kara, and one other powerful Jenner, they had 14,000 Rakshasha soldiers. And they came upon Ram and Sita in the forest, and Lakshman. And they were going to attack Ram. So Ram told Lakshman, take Sita and hide her. This was in Panchavali. And he completely annihilated the entire 14,000 Rakshas. Big, powerful generals. Kara was actually the son, one of the sons of Ravana. One, one, one soldier escaped, Alambana. And he went back to Ravana, and he said to Ravana, our whole army has been devastated by this human being. He's a very powerful Kshatriya. And he described the whole scene. And then he also described that this person has a beautiful wife, and that wife is perfect for you, Ravana. <laughs> so you should make your plan. So Ravana's listened, and at the same time he's amazed, not amazed, he's shocked to hear that his entire army was destroyed by this one person who's a human. He's a Rakshastra. If you understand, you understand according to Shastra. Rakshastras are a superior race than humans. They're more intelligent and more powerful than human beings. There are planets of Rakshastras that are above the earth. They're there even today. <laughs> Some of them decide to become, you know, president of the United States <laughs> or some other country. <laughs> they sneak in. <laughs> well, that's a whole other story. <laughs> We're not getting into the local news. Today. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, so, Robin is thinking, wow, this girl sounds really, really attractive. She has to be part of my, you know, collection. So he's thinking, he uh, sounds very powerful, so I need some help. So he remembers Maricha, that same demon that was hit by the arrow. Now he's living in the forest. He retired from his demoniac activities. He's, uh, he's on the unemployment line now. <laughs> He quit. <laughs> In fact, when Ravana came to him, and Ravana said, Maricha, I have some service for you. What is that service? I'm no longer active. No, this is one more thing you should do. What is that? There is this person called, uh, and he started saying Ram. As soon as he heard the word Ram, Maricha shook in fright. He said, oh my God, he is so powerful. He said, well, actually, I want you to, he has a beautiful wife, who I'm attracted to, and I want you to somehow allure 
Ram away from Sita. And if you can do that, then I can capture Sita. And you, Maricha had the power to change his form. He could change his form into any form. In those days, demons were quite powerful. They could change their forms at will. And even, even saintly persons could also do that. Nowadays, people don't have that same powerful. That's Kali Yuga, everything goes down. <laughs> I'll tell this last story. And then, so, Maricha said, I'm not gonna do it, forget it. <laughs> and Ravana said, well, if you refuse me, I'll kill you. <laughs> and Maricha was thinking, well, if, if I do it, I'll be killed by Ram, and if I don't do it, I'll be killed by Ravana. So I think I'll be killed by Ram, that's better. <laughs> so he didn't have much of a choice. So he agrees. Now he takes the form of this beautiful deer, a golden deer that's very luminous. And it's got bright gems all over. Sita's there, Rama's there, Lakshman there, they're all together. All of a sudden this demon, this deer starts prancing around Sita. And Sita said, oh, look, Ram is a beautiful deer. So nice. I would like to have that deer. We're going back to Ayodhya in about a year. I'll take it back and I'll, it'll be my favorite pet. Ram's not saying anything. <laughs> Lakshman's looking at the deer and thinking. And then he says, I know all 8,400,000 species. And this is not one of them. <laughs> it's a demon. <laughs> and then, but Sita's persistent. No, no, I want that deer. I want that deer. Ram, catch him for me. There he goes. There he goes. There he goes. Catch him. Catch him. Catch him. <laughs> and so Ram wants to satisfy Sita. So he says to Lakshman, Lakshman, you guard Sita and don't leave. I'm going after this deer. So Ram goes. And then Lakshman's there with Sita. And then, you know, Ram's chasing this deer and the deer is running this way and this way. And then Ram starts to understand. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a demon. So he takes his arrow. You ready? <laughs> <laughs> and he hits, you know, Maricha. Maricha's dying. But while he's dying, he had the power to imitate Ram's voice perfectly. So when he, he's calling out, Lakshman, help, I need help, please come, help. And then Sita's hearing this, Lakshman's also hearing this, and Sita says, oh, your brother's in trouble, go help him, he, he's calling for you. Lakshman said he can take care of himself, <laughs> he's all right. No, oh, no, he needs your help. Go, go, go. I can't leave you because if I leave you, you'll be unprotected. It's dangerous. There's so many Rakshasas around. No, no. And then she starts changing her whole attitude. Now I understand your mind. You just want to be with me. Mm. Oh, wow. And Lakshman became furious. <laughs> he started to boil. <laughs> Kshatriyas, when they get angry, watch out. <laughs> so, but he was insulted at the same time. So he, but Lakshman was so, what we say, what's the word? So chaste in his association that he never looked above her feet. He was always looking at her feet. He would never even look at her. And he would serve both of them day and night. He took care of them so nicely. Now she's accusing him of wanting to have her. And he's insulted. He said, all right, I'm going to leave. But I don't want you to be, you know, uh, unprotected. So he took his bow and he drew a circle. It was like a chakra. He said, you stay in the middle of this circle and don't go out because this circle will protect you. And then he left to find Ram. And, and then all of a sudden, Ravana comes. And he's, he's a, a sannyasi. <laughs> he, 
<laughs> He's dressed like, be careful of sannyasis. <laughs> Hare Krishna. <laughs> Bakshish. <laughs> That's why we're here. You know, when I was in when I was in India, I finally found out what is the real duty of a sannyasi. It took me 50 years. No, not so much. Well, I've been in a movement 51 years, but I've been a sannyasi for 38 years. So after 38 years, I found out what the real business of a sannyasi is. It is to accept garlands, <laughs> to sign books, to feed babies, to give blessings to unborn children, to cut cakes. Yeah. And there's a few other things that were, were yeah, it's our main duty. <laughs> huh? 